Good morning, everyone. Before we start, I know probably someone that was before me has prayed, but we are just going to start with prayer, if you don't mind, even if it's just for my sake. We are just going to spend a minute praying before we jump into this week's message. Father, we want to thank you for this time we can have receiving from you, hearing from you, from your word. Lord, I just pray that you would come and have your way in us today. Come and speak, come and move, come and shift our mindsets where it's needed. And Lord, I pray that your words would just stay like glue to us today, Father, that we would go home with these words and be able to apply them to our lives and answer the call that you have for us today. In Jesus' name we prayed. Amen. Amen. Right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. If you don't know, maybe it's your first time here, then a big welcome to you again. Uh, maybe you've been here before, but somehow for one reason or another, you're not aware. We're in a series on the book of Romans at the moment, and it's been great. And we've just finished chapter four last week, and today we're going to jump into chapter five. And so we've been looking in detail at Paul's letter because we believe that although it was written for the Romans then, it's still so relevant for us today. And there's so much that we can learn from that letter, just like we can learn from the whole of the Bible, but this letter as well. And so chapter five today, and actually it's a bit like we start in a new section of the book of Romans, if you'd like, because chapter one to four, there's a lot of ideas and concepts that um, Paul plants into those chapters that he then draws from in the coming chapters, in this one and the coming ones. So it's a bit like starting a new section of the book, if you'd like. So You'll notice that words come back that we've looked at, like justification or wrath of God and stuff like that. So just be ready for that, but we'll still make use of them because it's still relevant. So shall we read it together? Are you ready? Right, I'm going to say, I'm, you ready? Are you ready? And you give me a, I'm ready. Yeah, so are you ready? Great, we're going to assume that that went well. Thank you, Jesus. Open your Bible, Romans chapter 5. Time to get the Bibles out. I'll give you a minute to get there. We'll read from verse 1 to 11 today. So it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Woo! There's a lot in that section. So much in those few verses and we could probably spend a lot of time on each of those verses but you know what God knows what he's doing this morning so it's all gonna be okay first in the first verse it starts with good news right and repeats as I said previously some of the things we've heard from in previous chapters like the fact that we've been justified through faith and have now peace with God and you know what Paul can probably not repeat that sentence enough. It's such good news. It means that you, me, we as a collective, everyone that places their faith in God is at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because of what he has accomplished. I mean, wow, what 
good news. Now, if we jump to verse 6 to 11, so the first verse says, we have peace with God because of what Jesus has accomplished, right? Verse 6 to 11 then lay out exactly what Jesus has done for us. It says that while we were still sinners, powerless to bring any change to our lives, God demonstrated his love for us by sending his own son to die for me, for you. And so we've been saved from the wrath of God. And remember, we talked about the wrath of God a few weeks back, the redemptive wrath of God and the eternal wrath of God. And I want to encourage you, if you've missed those weeks or any other week of the Roman series, carve out some times this week to just go back and listen to those messages because it's like they're building on each other. And so it's important to, to play catch up where you might have missed something. So the wrath of God, we talked about the fact that we've been saved from the wrath of God um, because of the cross. The cross was the place where God's wrath and love collided, right? The cross was like a lightning rod that took all of God's wrath on it. Jesus was on that cross and he was the only one having never sinned that would be the perfect sacrifice to be able to achieve that. And so now we could be reconciled with God through what Jesus has done for us. And not only that, not only reconciled, but justified, justified, just as if I had never sinned. And so we boast in God. The section finishes with that. We boast in God and what he has done for us because he has reconciled us with him and we are now at peace with God. Now, just reading this section and, and me just talking about it like that for a minute should set you off, right? It should get you pumped and excited. Why? Because it means today and every day going forward, you can live a very different life than before when you didn't know God or didn't acknowledge him as your savior. Those few verses, that truth of what Jesus has accomplished for you and for me changes everything. It changes everything everything and so it's so important that we don't just look over it like yeah I know that bit I'm saved no actually Jesus and what he accomplished changed everything for us and before we get too ahead of ourselves I actually want to take a, a step back this morning and I want to draw attention to a story that's found in the Old Testament to show a, a very vivid example, let's say, of what things were like then and how vital Jesus going to the cross for us was. So we're going to turn to Numbers 16. Numbers 16. And while you turn there, I'm going to try and give you some context to what's happening. Now, there's a lot happening at that time for the Israelites. So I'll give you a quick recap. Essentially, there's Aaron and Moses, Moses and Aaron, and they are leading the people. And the people, well, to put it simply, they're not the easiest bunch of people to lead. So they're having a bit of a, of a tough time. There's just been a rebellion in the camp. So there's a bunch of Levites that thought they knew better than everyone. And there's one of them was named Korah. Uh, and, and, and they were disagreeing with Moses and Aaron. And so they all go in front of the tent of meeting. The Lord speaks to Moses. And anyway, Moses gets everyone involved in the conflict to stand in front of the tent, right? And Moses says, look, if they die of a natural death, then you know I'm wrong. If they die of a, of a incredible thing, then you know the Lord is with me and they were wrong, right? Essentially, that's what the story says. And as they stand there in front of their tent, the earth opens up, swallows them whole and boom, they're gone. So all the ones that did wrong got swallowed up. And what we're going to read now takes place the day right after these events, right? And so it goes, verse 41, number 16. The next day, the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. First, let me say, they've got guts to be able to still grumble with Moses and Aaron based on what just happened yesterday. I mean, honestly, anyway, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You have killed the Lord's people, they said. But when the assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned towards the tent of meeting, suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of meeting and the Lord said to Moses, get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. And they fell face down. Then Moses said to Aaron, take your censer, put incense into it, along with burning coals from the altar and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. 
Broth has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. So Aaron did as Moses said and ran in the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron, <laughs> but Aaron offered incense and made atonement for them. He stood between the living and the dead and the plague stopped. But 14,700 people died from the plague, in addition to those who had died because of Korah. Then Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting, for the plague had stopped. Now you can see there's, a load, there's loads again happening in there. The people rebelled, right? They did wrong. They sinned, essentially. We still sin, by the way, today. And so God in his righteousness cannot let that go, right? We've talked about the wrath of God and all that, so you know. But Aaron comes in and saves the day for the Israelite. Well, both of him and Moses, really. But what a story. And, and, and aren't you glad that all of that is not something we have to live in anymore, right? The, the incense, the sacrifices, the cleansing, all of that, because yes, we still sin just like the Israelites did. But because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, that was the perfect sacrifice that was good for then and forevermore, we do not have to go through any of that process. We live now in a different reality because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Everything is now different. That's what the section of Romans really lays out. Everything is now different. Well, almost, almost everything. One thing remains the same. There's one thing that I want to capture from that section of scripture in Numbers. And that's the position that Aaron took. Aaron's position is what remains for us today from that story. Let's read that, that, little, that little bit again. It says, Aaron did as Moses said, ran into the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered the incense and made aton atonement for them. He stood between the living and the dead and the plague stopped. He stood between the living and the dead and the plague stopped. Now, let me tell you, you, me, all of us today are called to be like Aaron that day. We are the ones that are called to be Aaron in our day, to take that position that he took. You probably all know this verse that says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. It's found in 1 Peter 2, 9. We are called to stand between life and and death, just like Aaron did. Imagine him, right? Taking this position right in front of the people in that story, acting as a shield, if you like, for them, standing between life and death. Making atonement with incense, fair enough, we don't do that, but that would look like us contending in prayer today, right? That's the position we are called to take. Now, I want you to keep Aaron in mind as we go through the rest of this message. Keep this position that he took in mind. For I believe it's key for what God is going to say to us in the coming minutes, not hours, thankfully. Now, back to Romans, right? I want us to focus on the middle bit of today's section. Verse 3 to 5, it says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into the hearts, into our hearts, sorry, through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. See, often we can read the word and we read it so many times, and especially with our Western mindset which is so individualistic, which is so about me and me and more of me, <laughs> we can appropriate these verse and, and read them uh, strictly on a personal level, right? So when we, read it, when we read verses like we just read, we can often think of personal circumstances of what I need to persevere in and what I need to believe for, for this and that, that is touching my own personal life, where I need to stand firm. And that is, that is true. That is valid. That is important. I'm not saying that is not what the verse is saying today. But I believe that there's also another sphere of things, level of things, if you'd like, that we are going to talk about 
today. See, I'll make Aaron back in the Numbers story. Uh, he didn't stand for himself in that moment, but stood for in that position for a whole people, a whole nation. And as I said, we are called to do the same thing because you, me, we all part of a body, right? And as a body of faith, right? Kingdom faith, it's in the title. We believe that everything is for the glory of the kingdom. And in our believing, that's the faith part, kingdom faith. We believe and long to see God transform our towns, our region, our nation, the nations. And just like Aaron did, as a body, we take that position between life and death, between the facts and the truth, between the circumstances and the truth, between the state of our nation and the truth of what the word says. And so as a body, we hear things from the Lord that are on God's heart and choose to place our faith in that, choose to believe and not only believe, but then we speak them out into being, right? That's what faith does, speak things that are not, as though they were that's what we are called to do and no matter what it comes to that's how we need to approach every situation every situation now you're probably about to tell me that actually I've been talking about faith just now and verses three to five don't say anything about faith but it mentions hope right we get to hope at the end And so I want to tell you a bit about hope and faith. Now, faith and hope are closely linked and related, but they are still distinct from one another. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it's a famous verse. It says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So we see that they mentioned separately, right? Faith and hope. And then Hebrews 11, 1 lays out a sort of definition, if you'd like. And it says, faith is confidence in what we hope for. See, biblical hope is something different, right? And it is, again, closely linked to the faith that we have. I cannot talk about faith without talking about hope and vice versa. Later on in Romans, Paul says, hope must involve something that is as yet unseen. Hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? See, hope and faith look ahead they speak of what is to come they both involve believing with confidence in what is coming and so biblical hope isn't hope as the world would give us it doesn't sound like well I hope that Arsenal will win today and someone answering probably Pastor Clive well let's hope so well actually as a Chelsea fan I really hope they don't but that's not the hope that we are talking about here right the hope we're talking about is certain it's sure it's unwavering biblical hope someone put it like this they said biblical hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised and the strength of that hope is found in his faithfulness because we serve a God that is faithful to every word that he has spoken so what does that mean that the hope that we have won't fail us, that it is rock solid. It's rock solid. That's the hope that this passage is talking about. But I can't talk about that hope without talking about the faith that we have in those things. Because again, they are, they go hand in hand is what I'm trying to say. So this hope and the faith that we have is what enables us to persevere, as the verses say. It's about hearing God in each situation. And if he has spoken, we didn't know that it will happen. It's what enables us to stand and persevere. And that part is key, right? In every situation, Jesus only did what he saw the Father do. Jesus relied solely on what he heard from the Father to make a move, to move forward in every situation. And we need to be doing the same thing. Whatever suffering may come, We need to first hear God so that our faith is placed in him and our hope can be placed in the words that he has spoken and we persevere that way until we see the breakthrough, until we see the situation resolved or the hope fulfilled. And so as a church, as I said, we believe in for things, right? As a body, we believe for things that God has spoken to us whether that's in an individual's life at a very um, personal level or whether that's at a national level because God has spoken to us about the nation we live in and the nations that are around, as I was saying earlier. And so we stand 
between the situation and the hope of what is coming and we persevere. Now, does that remind you of anyone? Aaron, yeah, the guy we talked about earlier, that's exactly what he did, right? He stood between life and death, that word, the word says, between life and death, between the fulfillment of what God has spoken and what the situation looks like. Believing with unwavering faith, right? We talked about unwavering faith in chapter four. Last week, Abraham was described as a man that had unwavering faith that something is going to change. Something is going to happen because the truth trumps the facts because facts aren't final. The truth of what God has spoken is. Thank you, Lord. And all of that builds our character as believers. So what, what situations are we actually talking about in this verse? Well, the word that's used, we glory in our suffering, right? When it says that, the word suffering there, when you look up a definition of, you know, the, around that word, it says it means pressures. Pressure that makes us feel like there's no escape. And that can be so many things, right? Life tries to put pressures on us constantly. There's pressures in your own life, in your own circumstances, but then there's pressure again on a greater scale. What's going on, the direction of things politically, etc. But even though the definition says it might make you feel like there's no escape, we know because of the hope and faith that we have in what God has said that that is not the end. That is not the end because God, the God we serve is faithful and he's the God who makes a way where there seems to be no way. And so we know that there's going to be something on the other side and so we can be at peace. And peace is so important here. In my Bible, I don't know about yours, but in my Bible, in my translation, the title of this section of Romans is called Peace and Hope. And I remember the first verse we read Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's two things I want to say about peace, and it's important, right? Here's the first one. We're at peace with God, right? If we truly believe who we are in Christ, this is in Christ Jesus stuff. If you don't have the book, go find it. It's somewhere. This is in Christ Jesus stuff. If I truly believe who I've been made to be in Christ, that I am a new creation, then I'm not constantly wondering about, am I saved? Am I not saved? Have I done right? Have I sinned? Is God forgiven me? Has he not? No, we don't. We are at peace with God because of who we are made to be in him and our faith that is placed in that, right? So we have peace with God. But there's also peace from God, if you'd like. See, in any particular situation, when we hear God speak and believe, when we put our faith in what he has spoken, we also receive his peace for that situation, right? And so it doesn't matter what it looks like at that point. We, are, we all know the story of, of the disciples, right? They're in the boat and, and Jesus is sleeping and the disciples are freaking out. And, and remember, right? Most of those guys were fishermen. They were people of the sea, if you'd like. They, this isn't their first boat outing or whatever. They've seen waves. So for them to freak out the way they did and wake up the boss who is sleeping, it must have been pretty big waves, right? At least in my mind, they must have been like, you know, they thought they were going to die. But it doesn't matter what the storm looks like. It doesn't matter. The storm can come around us. The boat can be rocked back and forth. We can remain at peace because we know that God has spoken and no matter what it looks like, how bad it seems to be getting, how long we stand in the middle of the storm, we persevere in faith because we know that his word will be fulfilled. We persevere in faith. And as a church, that's what we are called to do. We have been chosen, you, me, to be like Aaron and stand in the gap between death and life, as I said. And we intercede. We intercede. We pray. We stand there until we see the fulfillment of what hasn't happened yet. We persevere in faith because of what has been spoken. And Aaron in that story obviously foreshadows what Christ was going to do for us. 
in his hand with incense by laying his life down. He brought instant salvation from the plague to the whole of Israel. Right? Well, almost, apart from the people who died. Jesus, by laying his life down on the cross, brought salvation to the whole of humanity, to the whole of the world. And us, by persevering, standing between the circumstances, the facts, the news, the state of our towns, whatever it is, the state of our nation, by intercession and with faith, we'll see what God has spoken come to pass. Now notice there was something that Aaron had to do in that moment, in that story, right? He was active. He was with the incense, making atonement, whatever this is, whatever it means for us, that we also have to be active in our faith. And I just mentioned that with intercession earlier, I mentioned about intercession and believing what God has said. So it's not just enough to sit back and say, well, if God has spoken, it's going to happen, right? So we can just sit back, relax, and it will all happen. But actually, God has chosen us to be the vessels through which he wants to release his will into being. And so we pray. We declare the truth. We rebuke the circumstances. We pray and declare God's will into being until we see it fulfilled. And so if you ever don't know what to pray for, if you ever wonder what God is up to and well, God hasn't really been saying anything to me, what's on his heart? A great place to start is to look at what God has been saying to us as a church. Because you are part of that body, right? And that body functions as one. So when God speaks to the body, he's also speaking to each of us. We have a part, you, me, we all have a part to play. We all have a part to play in these things. Like at the beginning of the year, when God spoke about this being a year of salvation, this being a year of miracles and wonders, what do we do? With that, we do what Aaron did. We stand in the face of those situations. We face the facts, but we contend, we persevere in faith until we see the fulfillment of those words that God has given us as a church. But you know what? Even beyond this year, even further in the future, God has given us words. God has given Pastor Clive a word about 5,000 households. 5,000 households coming to know the Lord and becoming disciples of Christ. Now, who's going to teach them to be disciples? You, me, all of us, not just Clive, not just me, all of us. All of us are going to see and be part of those 5,000 households come to know God, everyone together. See, that word isn't just supposed to be carried out by Clive and Jane, but by all of us. Each of us has to actively place their faith into that word and stand in the gap until we see it fulfilled. And we know that it will be fulfilled because of the hope and faith we have in God, in the fact that God has spoken. And so in our words, action, prayers, we are constantly releasing his will into being. See, we need to be breathing and living living out those words as a body. Because God has placed that call on kingdom faith church as a body. See, verse 6 to 11 of that chapter, as I said, repeat some of the stuff we've said before. But why is Paul hammering that down constantly? Why does he keep saying those things is it just to make you feel better no is it encouraging yes but why because it needs to become the truth of who we are it needs to be at our core who we are so that every time we take an action every time our mouth come or opens those are the words that come out the truth of who we are in Christ and how it can change someone else's life to reveal the truth to others. It's not just for ourselves, right? Paul says in Corinthians that everything must be done so that the church may be built up. What is he talking about? So that God's kingdom can grow. You are here today so that God can use you to bring his kingdom 
forward. You are not here today just to receive and feel good. You are not here today, dare I say, to be encouraged, although that has its place and this can be encouraging, but you are here today because you are part of the mission that we have as a church, right? You are here today to play your part in that. And so when God speaks, he's speaking to us as a body, but he's speaking to you individually as well. And he's asking today, do you believe these words that I've been speaking to this body of believers and so to you? Are you going to play your part in this greater thing that I'm doing? Because right, Acts 1.8 says, it says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It doesn't say Clive or Kevin, you know, will witness or whatever. You are a functioning part of this body and together we need to believe. Play some faith, our faith in what God has spoken to us as a church concerning the lost, concerning our nation, concerning Israel, Europe and the nations. We need to persevere against the pressures of whatever comes against us, the pressures of life, pressures of society until we see the fulfillment of these words take place. You and me, mate, we are on a mission. We are on a mission and it's time to step up to the plate for each of us to come onto the field and play our part. Turn to whoever's next to you and say, play your part. Play your part. Thank you, Jesus. It's so important that we get that. God's heart behind what he's doing. You are not just part of Kingdom Faith Church because that's a place you go to. You when you say I'm part of this body, you are part of what the body is called to do as well, right? We all are part of fulfilling that mission. And it's so important that today we answer that call, that we take Aaron's position and stand between circumstances and what the word of God has spoken. And whatever it looks like, we stand until we see heaven come to earth until we see that revival that he's spoken about until we see those 5,000 households saved until we see people in the church get a right understanding of Israel and all of that because that's another mandate that's on the church right to be a lead boat in a biblical understanding of Israel and what it has to be and I'm not going to start another preach you get what I'm saying let's answer that call this morning let's answer that call to arms call to action because you need to answer it. You have a part to play in this. And as a body, we want to move as one forward into the things that God has for us. We want to persevere in faith until we see the hope fulfilled. Amen. We're going to pray now. We're going to pray and I want each of us to allow God to do something in us right now. I want you to picture Aaron standing and picture yourself as Aaron standing between life and death. Playing your part. And let God work that desire in you, that hunger to persevere, to answer this call to action. And maybe just declare afresh, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Father, I realize that I have a serving, there's something where I need to serve in what you're calling me to do, where there's a place for me to serve. There's a place for me, a part for me to play in this. So we'll pray now. I'll just pray. And then whoever's leading the service will come back and, and lead the rest of the response, if that's okay. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that everything, the truth, everything we need is found in your word. And Father, I thank you that we have called us each of us individually to a life that is greater than ourselves. You have called us to be your witnesses to the world that does not know you yet. And that looks like many different things, but one thing's for sure is that we all have a part to play in that. And this shouldn't be a pressure thing. I thank you that we've read about peace 
And the peace we get, Lord, there's peace in that because you show us the way, you lead us, you give us the words when we step out, you do all of that. And Father, I pray, give us this fresh hunger, this fresh uh, realization of our part to play in this. As we pray, as we intercede in our own times with you for the things you have spoken to us as a body. Father, we are all going to get involved all play our part lord find us willing vessels i pray find us willing vessels and me and my house lord me and my house we will serve you father whatever that looks like we will serve you lord my life is not my own my life is not my own i live for your glory for the glory and the advancement of your kingdom Thank you, Lord, for what you have spoken to us today. In Jesus' name we prayed. Amen. Amen.